Good evening. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming out in this cold February evening. This is the first in a series of three events with Irish writers. The next will occur on April 8th and features Kieran Carson. This will be followed by a reading and conversation with Paul Muldoon on April 18th, and I hope to see you there too. Before we begin, I want to thank the people whose hard work made this event possible. The Center for the Study of Europe, directed by Vivian Schmidt, has done an immeasurable amount to bring international writers of stature to campus. So to them, and in particular to Elizabeth Amrian for her administrative genius and eloquent emails, our gratitude. The Center for the Humanities, to our immense gratitude too, has underwritten poetry programs at BU for the 10 years that I've been doing this. Uh, Bill Pierce and the literary journal Agni and the newly established Institute for the Study of Irish Culture, of which I am chair at BU, also deserve our thanks. For their willingness to participate in this event, we are grateful to Joe Rezik, Assistant Professor of English, Christopher Ricks, the William M. and Sarah B. Warren Professor of the Humanities at BU, and Colm Toybean. Lastly, thanks also to Jean Height of Barnes & Noble Bookstore and the staff of Facilities and Catering who set this up before we arrived and will break it down after we've left. Thank you to all. Next, the Irish Consul General, Michael Lonergan, has generously agreed to say a few words to set the evening in motion. Then Joe Rezik will introduce Christopher Ricks and Colm Toybean. Um, just a small note, if audience members after the reading could wait till you have the microphone in hand before asking a question, um, that would be very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at Boston University at the inaugural event for the Institute of Studies of Irish uh, Culture, and I don't think you could have done much better than having a uh, Colm Tobin. I was had a great pleasure being with Colm on one of his last visits to Boston, uh, or at least he's been here since he hasn't told me, but in any case, we were two years ago and we had a very memorable uh, day and evening and, uh, and, uh, and night, um, um, so you're in for a very... Uh, <laughs> Very pleasant time. I, I should make a confession that I, I, was, I was so carried away in my remarks that time in praising his then uh, new novel, which, which truly was, uh, was excellent, uh, Brooklyn, that I spent the entire evening calling it Brookline. Uh, uh, and only at, the, only at the end, my wife pointed out saying, saying, you know, and I think it was just one of these things, when you start with a mistake, you're consistent throughout. But I, I guess, uh, I, guess uh, I, can, I can forgive myself by saying such is my affection for Boston and the surrounding cities that uh, I could see no other pronunciation. Uh, but in any case, uh, I, um, uh, I, I, uh, it's funny to look, to look back on it. Um, my job here is to represent the uh, Irish government in, in New England, and a very pleasant uh, job it is too, uh, particularly at this time of the year, Heading into, um, heading into St. Patrick's Day and into all the events here in March. This is uh, our, one of our busiest times of the year, but it's a great time to focus on Ireland and to launch something like this institute here in, in BU, because as, we can, as, as the month of March goes on, I always say to people, it's not St. Patrick's Day, it is St. Patrick's Month. And quite literally, that is, that is true here in, in New England with the amount of parades and festivals and events uh, that, that happen. And there's such a richness of cultural connections between Ireland and Boston, that I don't need to tell you, sitting here at BU, about them. Uh, they're all around us. But what I find very interesting, the more I spend time here in Boston uh, and in New England, the more you see how much more nuanced and subtle these uh, connections are. It's not just that the, at the connections we're all so familiar and aware with of the amazing contribution the Irish have made to Boston in terms of the politics of the city and the economy and so on, but there are so many other subtle ways in which both countries have contributed back and forth I was down last week in New Bedford where there was a very interesting symposium talking about the connections and links between Daniel O'Connell and Frederick Douglass. And members of Frederick Douglass's immediate family were there and they were talking about Douglass's visit to Ireland during the famine in 1845 and the influence that Daniel O'Connell had on the teachings of Frederick Douglass and how impressed O'Connell was when he met Douglass in Dublin in that brief meeting in 1845. And this opens up a whole new chapter of the kind of connections that happen uh, between the Irish experience and, and, and the United States one. And no doubt that over time this new institute will have plenty of, of room uh, to, to follow because no matter how much has been... Uh, as somebody once said, it, it's all been said but not everybody has said it 
but in the in the rich tapestry, I think of, of Ireland and Irish studies, there are so many new areas to, to open up and, and to look into. And I know that, that that will happen here in this new, new institute. So I'm delighted to be here at the opening event. I'm going for a real uh, treat uh, with Colm. I want to thank you for the invitation, and I also want to say that uh, the consulate, uh, which is just around the corner, really here in Copley Square, are delighted to stay involved and support any of these initiatives in any way we can. So thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to a very wonderful evening. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Joe Rezik, and I'm Assistant Professor of English at BU, where I teach 19th century British and American literature and the history of the novel. I'm honored to have the task now of introducing Cullum Tobin, who will read from his work tonight, and Christopher Ricks, who will join Tobin on stage and ask a number of questions and then moderate our discussion. I'll start with Christopher Ricks, who is William M. and Sarah B. Warren Professor of the Humanities at Boston University. In the past, he has served as professor of English at the University of Bristol and at Cambridge University. And in 2004, he was elected professor of poetry at Oxford, an honor held in recent decades by the poets Seamus Haney and Paul Muldoon, and less recently by W.H. Auden and Matthew Arnold. <laughs> professor Ricks is the co-director of BU's Editorial Institute and is himself the editor of many texts, including the standard edition of Tennyson's poetry, the, Oxford, the New Oxford Book of Victorian Verse, and editions of T.S. Eliot and Samuel Beckett. Professor Ricks has written too many books of scholarship and criticism to name on figures as such as Milton, Keats, Tennyson, Geoffrey Hill, and Bob Dylan. My first encounter with Ricks's writing was a revelation. While in graduate school in Los Angeles, I was known to talk too much about Wordsworth. <laughs> that doesn't happen a lot in Los Angeles, so that's why it's a problem. <laughs> A friend of mine, educated at Cambridge, wouldn't hear any more of it until I had read an essay in Ricks's 1984 book, The Force of Poetry. Ricks told of Wordsworth's use of line endings to create meaning, of what he called the significant vacancy that follows a carefully chosen word at the end of a line of blank verse, a pause that enriches the white space on the page. This space, which was once invisible to me, now seemed, as Ricks put it, a potent absence, filled with subtle and mysterious intimations. The essay changed or fairly shaped the way I teach and read Wordsworth. Praise for Ricks has come from loftier quarters. Auden himself wrote in The Listener that Ricks is, quote, exactly the kind of critic every poet dreams of finding. Cullum Tobin is a writer also drawn to potent absences. As a novelist, those he finds in silence. Reading Tobin, we learn to find the deep meanings in what characters do not say, even as we overhear them listening to the silence of others. Tobin is a famously spare writer, giving us little direct guidance about how to feel about an event, a scene, a space, an emotion, death, or sadness. His first novel, The South, about an Irish woman who leaves home for Spain does this elegantly and brutally, as does his late book, Brooklyn, about an Irish woman who leaves home for America. Tobin's interest in silence made him listen more attentively to Henry James than anyone had before, and the result was his astonishing 2004 novel, The Master. Tobin's latest book, sorry, Tobin's latest project has, has decided to do something similar with the life of the Virgin Mary in a novella and play, both called The Testament of Mary, which he'll read from tonight. Those books are as harrowing and as intense as we could possibly desire, and he retells the story, I don't know if I'll read it from this tonight, of Lazarus. And it is clear in that scene we are to make much more of Lazarus's silence after being resurrected. It appears in his novel unwillingly than anything one could say about the subject. Over the course of his career, Colm Tobin has written seven novels and a dozen other books of fiction and nonfiction that cover a huge range of subjects, from Ireland and Irish literature to gay history to Barcelona to Argentina and the history of literature, and about cultural figures including James Baldwin, Lady Gregory, Matthew Barney, Borges, Henry James, Oscar Wilde, Almodovar, and Barack Obama. He is a prolific critic and essayist for the New York Review of Books and the London Review of Books, and has taught writing and literature at Princeton, Stanford, Manchester, the University of Texas, and now at Columbia University, where he is the Irene and Sidney B. Silverman Professor of the Humanities, 
twice shortlisted for the Booker Prize for the master and for his 1999 book, The Blackwater Lightship, and winner of countless awards, including the Impact Dublin Prize, Tobin's works have been translated into 30 languages. A native of Ireland, but truly a citizen of the world, I'm delighted to welcome him here tonight. Colin Tobin. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much, Joe, for inviting me and for that introduction. Um, since it's coming into March, there are aspects of the relationship between Ireland and Boston that I would just like to invoke. One of them is that um, Henry James's grandfather came from Ulster, um, from County Cavan, and he was a Presbyterian. And he came at the end of the 18th century, and he came, in, in, one of the reasons he came was that religious freedom was not available to Presbyterians in Ireland at that time. And they were almost sandwiched between Catholics and um, members of the Church of Ireland. And one of his closest friends in his early years in America, he became, by the, by the time he died, he, he was the second richest man in New York State after Mr. Astor. But um, one of his closest friends um, was Thomas Addis Emmett, the brother of Robert Emmett, who was executed um, for leading a rebellion um, in Dublin um, in 1803. And um, the relationship between the Emmets and the Jameses continued um, over the generations, so that Henry James's father knew Robert Emmett's famous speech from the dock off by heart and could recite it, the one that says, until Ireland takes its place among the nations of the earth, let not my epitaph be written. And three of Henry James's first cousins, um, three women, um, two Temple girls and one a James cousin, Catherine James, married Emmets. So that um, every year he would say, Henry James would say, the Emmetry are arriving in London. <laughs> and that included the painter Bay Emmet, who was a descendant of Thomas Addis Emmet. But I I'm interested in that relationship because I'm interested in tracing an idea of liberty. Of, of ideas from Ireland, um, from Presbyterian Ulster, that made its way, for example, into the rebellion of 1798 in Northern Ireland, um, and made its way to America with the Presbyterian um, emigration from Ulster in the early years of the 19th century. And, and there's a moment I want to invoke, which is that when the Civil War broke out, Henry James's father began to think about slavery. Um, and, and, and realised that um, it was an abomination. And um, he's, um, his two younger sons, um, Bob and Wilkie, he put into the school at Sandburn, so they were in school with John Brown's children, and they both joined. And they both joined the 54th, 55th regiments, and they went through Boston at uh, the first time that African Americans um, had been in uniform, going through Boston with their... Um, with their um, compatriots who were of Irish Presbyterian origin and Henry James's father um, and indeed Oliver Wendell Holmes's father or indeed Oliver Wendell Holmes, the judge's father were, were proudly watching this. And it's just one of those moments connecting um, Ireland to America, um, Irish Presbyterianism, which, which is one of the areas in Irish 19th century emigration that we often don't recognise um, as much as perhaps we should. Um, as being an important element in the creation of certain aspects of American liberty. Um, the other thing I want to say is that it really is an extraordinary honour um, that in a while I'm going to be sitting beside Christopher Ricks on, on, on the stage. Um, there, um, you, mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the Wordsworth quote, but there's a book just out. I, I, I don't know if you've seen it. It's the, it's the Selected Letters of Anthony Hecht. And um, there's a letter from Anthony Hecht to Alan Hollinghurst, not a thing you would imagine. They perhaps weren't friends, Alan Hollinghurst and Anthony Hick, but of course, Hollinghurst was the deputy editor of the Times Literary Supplement. And he wrote to um, Anthony Hecht, the American poet, to say, well, you know, could you give me your thoughts on Tennyson? And the letter simply says, you know, I had no time for him. He was the sort of poet I, di I didn't like. But in recent years, I have come to completely revise my view. And this has been caused by a single book. And of course, for many of us, that book, Christopher Ricks's book on Tennyson, simply changed the way we, we misread or didn't read or didn't rate that poet. And um, th that, 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 that has been a milestone for me in reading criticism about poetry. 
as indeed have his essays, including his ways of reading, for example, the poetry of Geoffrey Hill, Cliché's Responsible Speech, or the, the Keats and Embarrassment, which is, which is ingenious and, you know, it, it, it offers an entirely new way of reading um, certain poems by Keats. There's also a phrase of his from, that he probably doesn't even remember writing, but I have stolen it, I think, twice. Um, <laughs> Uh, perhaps three times, certainly once in public and maybe twice in private. Um, he said, and I have no idea about who or what, but it was in a review, and he said um, about somebody, and I think it's a wonderful uh, phrase, he was full of beans and eager to spill them. <laughs> and, uh, but in those books... Um, on Geoffrey Hill, um, I mean, in the work on Geoffrey Hill in the book, uh, in the book on Keats, there, there's a sense um, of reading a literary text with the sense of layers, all, all the layers that came before, that any phrase or any set of words we use now in English have roots, have echoes, have tendencies, have tendons, have tentacles, and that it's impossible almost to read without f reading into, finding earlier versions of a phrase in something else. And certainly when you come to this story, uh, the story um, which I took from the New Testament, it's not merely that from the paintings, the idea of Mary, the idea of the suffering mother of Jesus at the foot of the cross, as in um, so many paintings, or the Pieta, but also in the way that s certain people have ri written poems about this um, subsequently. Uh, and sometimes just when you're working, sometimes a word is enough to give you a scene or even much more than a scene. There's, there's a moment in Yeats's The Second Coming where he talks about the indignant desert birds. And you always envy po poets because, I mean, he just said they were, in, if you were a novelist, you see, if you said indignant desert birds, you'd have to explain how their indignation arose <laughs> and what the consequences of their indignation was later. I mean, what did they do then? But if you're a poet, you can just splash the word indignant desert bird, indignant. And of course, indig, you could be dig, dig. Indignant desert birds, and I always loved thinking about those birds, those indignant des desert birds. And um, there's a, there's another poem um, by Rilke which is called um, Orfeo Eurydice Hermes. There's a translation by Stephen Mitchell, and he talks about um, the idea of Eurydice um, and and death being having filled her, death almost coming to her as a gift. Talking about her own great. Death. She was filled with her own great death. And just that idea of somebody in the underworld. And, and so that when, Orf when Orpheus comes, all she knows later on is that someone or other, someone or other was ahead because she was so filled with her own great death that seeing a mere mortal was not part of her. Just that idea of filled with her own great death that phrase and um, the other one is the that when when I was planning this short book um, I, I, I really wasn't interested as interested in the miracles as I was in Mary's voice and since she hadn't actually witnessed any miracle except the water in, into the wine I, I was didn't think I would have to go there I didn't think that I would need to you know read a version of them in one of the Gospels and then start thinking about it and wonder where it would take me. The problem is that when you come to Lazarus, you, you can't avoid it. The story is so astonishing, as told by John. And again, of course, you realise that um, the English poet, um, I, mean, there, I mean, there are many references to this in poetry, but the English poet Elizabeth Jennings has two wonderful poems about Lazarus. Tom Gunn has a w wonderful poem, early poem called Lazarus Unraised, where the last line of every verse is, the appointed miracle did not take place. He made it into a sort of melancholy non-event, the whole Lazarus business. 
But so I'm just going to read two parts of this book. Um, the first is the opening. And the second um, is the Lazarus um, sequence. I'll start with the opening and then I want to just in between maybe the two readings, I'll talk a bit about the, the, uh, the, the efforts I have made, which I mean, I, I, before I started this book, I had a head of curly hair, as Joe will attest. <laughs> and the efforts over the last five years to adapt this for the theatre have broken my heart. And um, I've learned nothing either. They appear more often now, both of them, and on every visit they seem more impatient with me and with the world. There is something hungry and rough in them, a brutality boiling in their blood, which I have seen before and can smell as an animal that is hunted can smell. But I'm not being hunted now, not anymore. I'm being cared for and questioned softly and watched. They think that I do not know the elaborate nature of their desires. But nothing escapes me now except sleep. Sleep escapes me. Maybe I'm too old to sleep, or there is nothing further to be gained from sleep. Um, Maybe I do not need to dream or need to rest. Maybe my eyes know that soon they will be closed forever. I will stay awake if I have to. I will come down this passageway as the dawn breaks, as the dawn insinuates its rays of light into this room. I have my own reasons to watch and wait. Before the final rest comes this long awakening, and it is enough for me to know that it will end. They think I do not understand what is slowly growing in the world. They think I do not see the point of their questions, and do not notice the cruel shadow of exasperation that comes hooded in their faces, or hidden in their voices, when I say something vague or foolish, something which leads us nowhere. When I seem not to remember what they think I must remember, They are too locked into their vast and insatiable needs and too dulled by the remnants of a terror we all felt then to have noticed that I remember everything. Memory fills my body as much as blood and bones. I like it that they feed me and pay for my clothes and protect me and in return I will do for them what I can but no more than that. Just as I cannot breathe the breath of another or help the heart of someone else to beat or their bones not to weaken, or their flesh not to shrivel, I cannot say more than I can say. And I know how deeply this disturbs them, and it would make me smile this earnest need for foolish anecdotes or sharp, simple patterns in the story of what happened to us all, except that I have forgotten how to smile. I have no further need for smiling, just as I had no further need for tears. There was a time when I thought that I had in fact no tears left, that I had used up my store of tears, but I am lucky that foolish thoughts like this never linger or are quickly replaced by what is true. There are always tears if you need them enough. It is the body that makes tears. I no longer need tears, and that should be a relief. But I do not seek relief. Merely solitude and some grim satisfaction from ch- which comes from the certainty that I will not say anything that is not true. Of the two men who come, one was there with us until the end. There were moments then when he was soft, ready to hold me and comfort me as he is ready now to scowl impatiently when the story I tell him does not stretch to whatever limits he has ordained. Yet I can see signs of that softness still. And there are times when the glow in his eyes returns before he sighs and goes back to his work, writing out the letters one by one that make words he knows I cannot read, which recount what happened on the hill and the days before and the days that followed. I have asked him to read the words aloud to me, but he will not. I know that he has written of things that neither he saw nor I saw. I know that he has given shape to what I lived through and he witnessed, and that he has made sure that these words will matter, that they will be listened to. I remember too much. I am like the air on a calm day, as it holds itself still, letting nothing escape. As the world holds its breath, I keep memory in. So when I told him about the rabbits, I was not telling him something that I'd half forgotten and merely remembered because of his insistent presence. The details of what I told him were with me all the years in the same way as my hands or arms were with me. On that day, the day he wanted details of, the day he wanted me to go over and over for him, in the middle of everything that was confused, in the middle of all the terror and shrieking and the crying out, a man came close to me who had a cage with a huge angry bird trapped in it, the bird all sharp beak and indignant gaze. 
the wings could not stretch to their full width and this confinement seemed to make the bird frustrated and angry. It should have been flying, hunting, swooping on its prey. The man also carried a bag which I gradually learned was almost half full of live rabbits, little bundles of fierce and terrorised energy. And during those hours on that hill, during the hours that went more slowly than any other hours, he plucked the rabbits one by one from the sack and edged them into the barely opened cage. The birds went for some part of their soft underbelly first, first opening the rabbit up until its guts spilled out and then of course its eyes. It is easy to talk about this now because it was a mild distraction from what was really going on and it is easy to talk about it too because it made no sense. The bird did not seem to be hungry although perhaps it suffered from a deep hunger that even the live flesh of writhing rabbits could not satisfy. The cage became half full of half dead wholly uneaten rabbits exuding strange squealing sounds twitching with odd bursts of life. And the man's face was all bright with energy. There was a glow from him as he looked at the cage and then at the scene around him, almost smiling with dark delight, the sack not yet empty. Um, so what's happened um, is that this was performed in Dublin um, in the Theatre Festival of 2011 by the actress Marie Mullen, directed by Gary Hines. And that partnership, Marie Mullen and Gary Hines, they both have won Tony Awards in New York, Gary Hines is the first woman director to win a Tony Award um, ever. Um, that they had been working together for 35 years and suddenly I arrive with this and we have to get this text down from 27,000 words to something like 10 or maybe if Gary had her way, nine and a half thousand words. <laughs> and we have time, unfortunately. And um, <laughs> the um, ways then we begin to work. In other words, I'm, I'm watching a partnership that I have seen playing in all the plays by Singh, in um, Eugene O'Neill, playing um, contemporary play playwrights such as Tom Murphy, Brian Friel. I, I have seen almost every single piece of work these two women have done together. And now, and, and now I'm in the room with them and we're trying to get this right. And um, I remember on the opening night, or, well, sorry, it wasn't the opening night, it was one of the preview nights, I, I was walking up the theatre to, to sit at the back and I noticed um, a, a friend of mine who, if, if I went to confession, I would go to. Um, he's a wonderful priest, an old priest, a, a, a great theologian, um, slightly out of favour perhaps at the moment, but maybe in, in the future, <laughs> near future perhaps even he will be seen again as an important figure. But he's a wonderful man and someone who exudes great spirituality and I have enormous respect for him. And the last place I wanted to see him was at my play. In other words, <laughs> I said to him, what are you doing, Father? What are you doing here? Please, don't, like, like the, I, I nearly almost threatened him, could you just go around to the pub and I'll see you after or something. But then I realised, well, he wouldn't go to a pub. So, he, but he was so good. Uh, and I, after, he's such a good man. Afterwards, he said to me, um, you know, I enjoyed looking at it, but you know, my hearing is not as good as it was. I mean, he's old now. He was a great, he's a great diplomat. And I couldn't really hear it, but I was, it looked very interesting. And he looked at me with that full level of steely irony. You know, of every single part of him, looking into every single part of me, meaning, don't think I don't have the full measure of you. You know, and, uh, and if you think I'm getting upset, I haven't, you haven't a hope. And um, what, is, what is interesting is that, that the novel has not really developed very far. In other words, that the picaresque business of a novel being a journey, that someone sets off on a crusade, or Don Quixote sets off from one place to another, and um, that has remained in some odd way at the core of the novel, no matter what the novelist is, thinks the novelist is trying to do. People are always on their way places in novels. And if you're writing a novel, you almost don't think about that. In other words, you need, if you send somebody from Dublin to where I'm from in Wexford, it's the journey that matters. It's who they see on the train. It's a thought they have, a memory they have. It's an encounter they have which may become important in the book. And that um, a novel is filled with that business, that if there's A here and B there, then the space in between is the space the novel takes up. And, and, and um, 
what happens then when you try and put this on a stage, even if you have a single actress playing it as monologue, that will not work. The journey is of no interest. The audience becomes almost primitive in its needs. It needs instant adventure and excitement, and it, it doesn't need, if there's A to B, it needs to know the B part quickly, and A, so in other words, if you're leaving A, be very sure that you just give a lighting cue, and it's B. But the, all the meandering business of the connection between the two places will simply fall away as the audience wants to know now what happened in B, not what happened on the way to B. That was one of the things I learned. <laughs> um, and um, I learned also the, the, the strange way actors and directors work, that, that, uh, that the, the way in which it, um, I presumed the director would come in with a plan. The director comes in with a sort of terror of not knowing, of having no idea how this will play, and forcing the actors to show her, and then slowly it being built from not knowing rather than from a plan, which means that people are in a constant state of terror because if it doesn't work, it, you know, there, there's no plan B because there's no plan A. <laughs> and um, so the actress is constantly building and building, showing a different way to do something, and then that slowly is allowed to happen maybe for a paragraph. And um, I watched this happening the second time with Fiona Shaw and Deborah Warner, who are, the, I suppose, the most interesting partnership um, as a director and actress in British theatre. Um, and uh, again, I've seen most of their work. I, I, mean, I, I mean, from Hedda Gabler to Happy Days to The Wasteland to Medea, um, that, that, I, that I have seen their work. And I've, I, as with Gary and Marie, I've known them both for a long time. And the idea of being in the... Even though I remain on very good terms with, with these four women, I... I, I never was terrified by the actress, but I was really always terrified by the director because the director knew something. The director didn't know, and not knowing in the theatre becomes a sort of power. But they felt that I knew, and what I had to do was unknow. And they would look at me if I ever thought I could say something certain, and they'd say, no, that won't work. <laughs> and... Even, even some of the lines I read there, for example, I, real, I can remember a particular moment where the director would just turn to me and say, that line has to go immediately. And it's strange it was there in the first place. I mean, why was it there? And also that people in the theatre know nothing about novels, so the journey from A to B it doesn't interest them at all. And therefore, you are really in a, um, from the business of being in autonomous space as a novelist, constantly adding, judging, rereading, connecting, imagining more, and that the novel is only your business. You're in a collaborative space in which you don't actually have the same principles as the other people in the collaboration because you know, because you had the feelings before you wrote them. These things come from emotions that were there before. They're an expression of emotion. And it isn't as though you just simply make them up. They come from somewhere. Not simply from language. I mean, it's not simply that the word indignant there comes from the poem. But somehow or other something. I mean, that image of the rabbits and the, um, isn't in the New Testament. It's, it's in a diseased mind, which is mine. <laughs> and it, it, uh, if, you were, if you were treating me, for, I suppose for madness or depression or something, you would, and, and, and I told you that story, you would say, oh yes, we, we've had that before. It's, um, it's the result of something in your childhood and uh, we will, over the next two years, seek to exercise. That, in other words, that, that um, you operate at levels of, of the conscious mind, the conscious will, and the unconscious. But all of it is somehow or other, for, they're, they're all forms of knowledge. And what you're doing is trying to find words for them. But the, actors, the actor is working from exactly the opposite of no knowledge and no conscious will and, and constantly trying out something to see if it might work. And the director is even more creating an empty space that might be filled in some way or other. 
and that's how the process of a production comes into place. It's very, very frightening if you're a writer because every time you think you know something, the director is really skilled at turning to you to say, Colm, you don't know anything about the theatre, do you? <laughs> and, and no matter what you say, I mean, if you say, well, I, I think I do, and they say, well, that might be the problem, in fact, that you think you do, even more <laughs> the fact that you don't. Um, but in any case, um, um, th this weekend, um, Fiona Shaw and Deborah Warner are arriving in New York, um, and they're going to open this play in, in New York, in, obviously with a different sort of audience. I, I was aware when I was writing this book that I was hitting Ireland when it was down, you know, in other words, that, that there was a funny vacuum in, in Ireland, in, 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 uh, for example, in belief. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about the bust, although the bust is an important element in this. That, in other words, the confidence of the country had, had been dented economically. But I, I wasn't as interested in that as the way in which the church had seemed to lose its power. And I was wondering how much power was left or where belief would lie or what anyone believed, or, or how you could, as an artist, intervene in that without writing a pamphlet to see was there something else you could do. And of course, the idea of intervening where in something that might have been better left alone, which is the silence, the general silence um, of Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, that perhaps that might have been better left alone. But I didn't want to do that. And so the book came and the theatre pr production. And so the, the other bit I want to read then is the one that I didn't think I would need to write in this book. But because of, of, its, of its, it was something in the story itself, in, in the Lazarus story, um, I found myself in that strange way that, that going back to the notebooks, I write in longhand, going back to the notebooks and just finding that I needed another page and then oh my God, another page, and then, and then more images would come, fresh images beget, and so that it came and became much longer than it should have been. Um, and um, so anyway, this other section I'm going to read. Um, Close to the house of my cousin Miriam was the house of Lazarus. I had known him since he was a baby, of all the children that any of us had, he was, from the day he appeared in the world, the most beautiful. He seemed to smile before he did anything else. When we visited Ramira, his mother, she would put her, her fingers to her lips and take us across the room to where his cot lay. And when we looked in, he seemed to be already smiling. It made Ramira at times almost embarrassed, because when we came to visit, we would discover that we were not alone in feeling that we had come to visit the boy as he learned to walk and talk, as much as we had come to see his parents or his sisters. Instantly, as soon as other children saw him, they wanted him in their game. Whatever they did once he was there became peaceful and harmonious. I now know that he was alone among us in possessing something strange. He had not been visited by darkness or by fear, by what comes into our spirits in the deepest part of the night or the end of the Sabbath and lurks there. There were years when I did not see him, the years when the family moved to Bethany before they returned to live in Cana. But I always heard the news and it always included something about him. How he was growing up golden and graceful, serious and kind and how worried they were because they knew they would not be able to keep him among the olive groves and the fruit trees. That something would happen to him, that a great city would call to him, that the charm he exuded and his beauty grown manly now would need another realm in which to flourish. But no one realised that it would be the realm of death he was destined for, that all the grace and beauty, all of his aura of specialness, like a gift from the gods to his parents and his sisters, that all of it was a grim joke, like being teased by the, a smell of delicious food or the possibility of plenty, when it was really only something passing by, destined for elsewhere. I know that he moaned in pain for a day or two and then he was better and then the pains came again and they came in his head and they often lasted through the night and that he cried out. He cried out that he would promise to be good but there was nothing to be done. There was poison growing in his head. He began to weaken and he could not bear light, even a chink of light. 
If the door opened as someone came into the room, he would be enough for him. He would cry out. I do not know for how long this went on. I know that they cared for him, and I know too that it was as though a golden harvest had been mowed down by a night's dark wind, or a pestilence had come into the trees and shrunk the fruit, and it was unlucky even to mention his name or ask for news of him. So I did not ask for news of him, but I often thought of him, especially as I prepared to come to Cana. I wondered if I should visit him or his sisters, or as I set out I did not know that he had already died. When I arrived in Cana, there was a strange emptiness in the streets. I heard afterwards that for two hours or more, some days earlier, the birds had withdrawn from the air, as though it were night, or there was some cataclysm in progress that meant danger to them and made them retreat into their nests. And there was a hushed holding in of things, no wind, no rustling in the leaves of trees, no animal sounds, cats moved out of sight, and shadows, even the very shadows, stayed as they were. Lazarus had died a week earlier, and then when he was four days in his grave, my son and his followers reached Cana with their high-flown talk. And when my son told them to dig Lazarus up, remove him from his tomb, no one wanted to do this. In the days before he died, Lazarus had become peaceful and beautiful. No one wanted to touch him, now disturb him in the ground. But so great was the frenzy at the arriving horde and that his sisters had no choice. The crowd had arrived with news of a blind man who could see and of a gathering where there was f no food and which had, as though by a miracle, been filled with plenty. The talk was of nothing except power and miracles. It was as if the crowd was roaming the countryside like a swarm of locusts in search of want and affliction. But no one among them thought that anyone could raise the dead. It had occurred to no one. Most of them believed, or so I learned, that it should not even be attempted, that it would re represent a mockery of the sky itself. They felt as I felt, as I still feel, that no one should tamper with the fullness that is death. Death needs time and silence. The dead must be left alone with their new gift or their new freedom from affliction. I know because Marcus told me that Mary and Martha, the two sisters of the dead boy, began to follow my son once they heard the news of the lame walking and the blind seeing. And I understand that they would have done anything in those last silent days. They watched helplessly as their brother grew easily towards death. In the same way as a source for a river hidden under the earth begins flowing and carries water across a plain to the sea. They would have done anything to divert the stream, make it meander on the plain and dry up under the weight of the sun. They would have done anything to keep their brother alive. They sent word to my son and they asked him to come, but he did not. It was something I learned when I saw him, myself, that if the time was not right, he would not be disturbed by a merely human voice or the pleadings of anyone he knew. Thus he paid no attention to what he heard from Martha and Mary, and they stayed with their brother so they would be with him when he took his last breath, when he was fully part of the waves of the sea an invisible aspect of their rhythm. And during those last days then, as river water slowly took on the taste of salt, and they buried him and he lay fresh in the earth, many people who had loved Lazarus and who had known his sisters came to the house to comfort them. There was talk and lamentation. And then when they heard that the crowd had arrived like a carnival with every malcontent and half-crazed soothsayer following in its wake, Martha went out into the streets and to announce her brother's death to my son. She confronted him and won silence from him and those around him, and she cried out, If you had been here, he would not have died. And she was ready to go further, but stopped for a moment when she saw how sorry he was, when she saw how he knew or seemed to know that the suffering and death of Lazarus was a sadness almost too great for anyone to bear. And now it was a weight that could not be lifted. Having let the silence linger for some moments, Martha spoke again as the crowds listened. She spoke very quietly, but what she said was heard. She was so desperate in her grief that her pleading sounded like a challenge. I know, she said, that even now that he is four days in the earth, that you have the power to raise him. He will rise, my son, replied, as all mankind will rise when time relents, when the sea itself becomes a glassy stillness. No, Martha said, you have the power to do it now. And she told my son then what the others had told him, that he was not immortal, as we are mortal, but she believed that he was God's son, that he'd been sent to us in mortal guise, but he was not mortal, he had powers, that he was the one who we had been waiting for, who would be king on earth and in the skies, that she and her sister had been among those blessed enough to recognise him as they recognised him now, 
for the sake of her brother, she told him in plain loud words with her arms spread out wide that he was the son of God. When Martha found Mary who had returned to the grave to weep there. She too went to my son and told him that he had the power. As she wept, so did he, because he had known Lazarus all of his life and had loved him as all of us did. And He came with her to the grave, freshly covered with earth, and there was a murmuring from the crowd that had followed, people shouting that if he could heal the sick and make the crippled walk and the blind see, then he could raise the dead. He stood there, silently for a time and then in a voice like a whisper he ordered the grave to be dug up while Martha screaming now afraid that what she'd asked for was being granted cried that they had suffered enough and the body would be stinking and rotting after its time in the earth but my son insisted and the crowd stood by as the grave was opened and the soft earth lifted from where it lay over Lazarus's body once the body could be seen most of the onlookers moved away in horror and fright all except Martha and Mary and my son had called out the words Lazarus come forth and gradually the crowd came close again to the grave and this was the time when the bird song ceased and the birds withdrew from the air. Martha believed too that time was then suspended, that in those two hours nothing grew, nothing was born or came into being, nothing died or withered in any way. Slowly the figure, the figure dirtied with clay and covered in grave clothes, wound around him, began with great uncertainty to move in the place they had made for him. It was as though the earth beneath him was pushing him and then letting him be still, in his great forgetfulness and nudging him again like some strange new creature, jerking and wriggling towards life. He was bound with the sheets and his face was covered with a napkin. And now he turned as a child in the freshness of the womb who, know, who turns knowing that his time there is up and he must wrestle his way into the world. Loose him, let him go. My son said, and two men came, two neighbours, and they stood in the grave as those around watched in hushed amazement and fright as they lifted Lazarus and then unbound him. He stood up with merely a cloth around his waist. He had been unchanged by death. Once his eyes opened, he stared at the sun with a deep unearthly puzzlement and then at the sky around the sun. He seemed not to see the crowd. Some sounds came from him, not, not, not words exactly, something closer to whispered cries or whimpers. Then the crowd stood back as Lazarus moved through them, past them, looking at no one, being led by his sisters back to the house, the world around remaining stilled and silent, and my son, too, I am told, stilled and silent. As Lazarus began to weep. At first they noticed just the tears, but then his crying came in howls as the two sisters led him gently towards the house, away across the paths, followed all the time by the silent crowd as the howling grew louder and more fierce. By the time they reached the, their door, he could barely walk. They disappeared inside and closed the shutters from the burning sun and did not appear again that day, despite the waiting crowd who lingered hour after hour, even as night fell, and some indeed through the night itself and even as the morning came. And then just to skip a bit where um, a few days later she realises that Lazarus is going to come um, into the room where she is. In the kitchen the next morning, news came that Martha, Mary and Lazarus were going to come to Miriam's house first and then accompany us to the feast. Lazarus was still weak, we were told, and his sisters had become aware of how people were afraid of him. He lives with a secret that none of us knows, Miriam said. His spirit had time to take root in the other world. And people are afraid of what he could say and the knowledge he could impart. His sisters do not want to go alone with him to the wedding. I, dr I dressed carefully. The day was hot and the interior of the house was kept dark. We moved slowly in the dense and humid air. Miriam and I found ourselves alone several times in the main room of the house together, uneasy with each other, but not stirring from our chairs and not speaking. We were both waiting for the visitors to come. A few times when we heard sounds, we both looked at each other ominously, fearfully. Neither of us knew what would happen when Martha and Mary led their brother into this room. And as time went by, our wandering became more tense. Finally, in the stillness and the heat and the, and the silence, I fell asleep. When I woke, Miriam was standing over me, whispering, they're here. They have finally arrived. The sisters looked more beautiful than I'd ever seen them. In their solemnity, as they entered the closeness of the room and approached me, they were figures of substance, grandeur, immense dignity. It was as though they had been marked and separated from others by what they had been through. It came across in their poise, depth in the expression on their faces when they smiled. As they both came towards me, 
I realized that, that, I was asso- that I was associated in their minds with what had occurred and they wished to touch me, embrace me, thank me, as if I had something to do with the fact that their brother was alive. Their brother stood in the doorway and then moved quietly into the room. When he sighed, all of us moved towards him and it was then, just then, that the opportunity came. And it was the only one I had and I think it may have been the only opportunity anyone had to ask him. It was the semi-darkness of the room, the stillness of the air, and the fact that all of us, us four women, would know to keep silent about what we should not speak of. There There were a few seconds in which any one of us could have asked him about the cave full of souls where he had been. Was it a place of massive, obliterating darkness, or was there light? Of wakefulness, or of dreams, or of deep sleep? Were there voices, or was there pure stillness, or... Some other sound like the dripping of water or sighs or echoes. Did he know anyone? Did he meet his mother, whom we had all loved? Did he remember us as he wandered in the place where he had been? Was there blood or pain? Was it a landscape of dull washed colours or a red vastness with cliffs or forests or deserts or encroaching mist? Was anyone afraid? Did he wish to return there? Lazarus stood in the darkened room and sighed again. And something was broken. The great chance had escaped us. Maybe never to return. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great. Wonderful poem, thank you. I'd like to invite Christopher Ricks up here now to ask a few questions. And when, as Christopher, whenever you like, you can open the discussion to the group. And if, be sure to wait for the microphone um, if you ask a question. Uh, do you know how to turn it on? Oh, is mine turned on? Is this turned on? Are these turned on? The, the monitors, the... I think they're on, are they? They are. They're on. Okay. They're on. Thank We're you. on. We're on. Okay, thank you. Um, do you remember writing that um, um, he was full of beans and eager to spill them? No. <laughs> but if I remembered all the wonderfully witty things I had said over the years. And, <laughs> um, let, let, let me start seriously by joining the admiration and gratitude that's in the room. I, I just want to identify the two ways in which works of art, uh, to me, most matter. One way is by confirming and corroborating things that I believe and have felt and thought. And the other is quite different. It's the entrance into systems of belief and a world where I can do no more than entertain what I, what I learn of and not believe it. You know I mean? William Empson is always saying that the trouble with literary studies is that they tend to suggest that agreeing with what you read is the only... Ver- that is, confirmation and corroboration are the only thing that we humanly want. Now, the world that you evoke in your writing, and I imagine the world within you, which overlaps with it but is not the same as it, is immensely distant from me. Uh, everything that I hear is it, it's as if it, I, if it could come from another species for me or absolutely from another planet. Are you a Christian, uh, Christopher? Uh, no, but nor are you. <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, no it, it is for me. What, what I have access to systems of belief that are extraordinarily different from mine, um, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And I felt, I felt in the room that there was an immense responsiveness, but it was valuably very, very different. It was sure to be very, very different. From what parts of what you evoke there is it necessary to dissent appreciatively? Um, so that, that, just start with that, and that's not a question. I'll just say one other kind, give you one other kind of praise, if okay. I may. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no. <coughs> you did notice that that was praise. I did. Good, thank you. <coughs> um, Matthew Arnold, who lived very recently, you'll remember. Um, uh, <laughs> Matthew Arnold said about a great moment in, in Dryden's prose that it was a prose such as we would all gladly write if we only knew how. Now, that's only one kind of wonderful prose, but it is the kind of prose that you put before us. There's a feeling all the time, a prose such as we would all gladly write if we only knew how. It has extraordinary speed and rhythm and patience at the same time. And I think you should sack your publishers because on the cover of the white edition of this book, they truncate abominably your sentence. 
And a sentence which went on with an impeccable cadence and series of cadences is locked off into melodrama. So I would like you to sign up for my publishing house tonight. <laughs> <and all. clears throat> but it did bring home to me how extraordinarily different it is to have, let's have the full cadences. And you read very, very beautifully. And I love the way in which, as you were speaking, simply of the cooperative, the cooperation of the conscious and the unconscious, you found yourself talking of tendencies and of tendons, and of tentacles, and then you moved quite effortlessly into the testament. And I didn't at all feel that it was planned as it might be by evil people uh, in order to work upon us. It came to you as naturally and um, as the leaves to a tree. And I thought that was ex ex exceptionally beautiful. Um, I'll say one other thing, and then we will open it, please, to questions. I fear for your work in the vicinity of the predatory genius of Fiona Shaw. Uh, I think she has a kind of genius and I think it's a predatory genius. Uh, I think it's real and I think when it's cooperated with or colluded with by Deborah Warner I fear even more. Your book is not a rabbit but it's going to be put in a cage. It's going to be put in a cage with these people and do you sometimes wonder whether that was altogether wise? So that's a question. Oh, I think I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm absolutely clear about that, 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 that in other words, in, in fully handing it over um, to somebody whose voice, whose body, whose, whose, whose entire presence as an actress on the stage is to take the thing and embody it, that I gave it to her. And I will be there, um, in, in spirit at least. You know, uh, some of me will be there in the audience. And the rest of me, of course, will be at home alone, uh, you know, with, with, with the next thing, or at least yeah. complete. Yeah. But that if you work with some, you know, if once you go into the theatre with people who are talented, you have to go in in a spirit of utter self-suppression, <laughs> self-annihilation. And it, it, in other words, you go in in the lovely spirit that we all, that we all learned. I mean, in other words, you could go in in the spirit of Benedict um, yesterday. That, that simply, I will disappear. No one will ever see me again. I do not matter in the future. There's a lovely moment, in, it happens in Daniel Deronda when Gwendolyn is about to lose everything, and she wants to do that too. Benedict and Gwendolyn are quite close, in fact, and they're, you know, she says, if, if, since I can't be rich, since I can't be impetuous, mm -hmm. I will be a cloistered <coughs> nun. You know, but I'm, I, so that my response to your question is, uh, being a good Catholic, I know uh, about self-suppression, and I know, you know, the, the urges through my teenage years to become a Trappist monk, or to, to take vows of obedience, or poverty, or God knows even chastity, a poor old chastity. And um, so, so the only way to, 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 to do it is deliberately, and the only way to be deliberate about it is with <coughs> full ideas that I no longer matter or exist. And... Um, that, that I, you know, that you just simply do that to yourself because there's no other way. It's dark. It's a lovely idea. Well, I do fear for it. I mean, I thought The Wasteland was astonishing. I saw it only on screen, not on the stage. It must have been even more astonishing on stage. But I think it, I, I, I say there's a kind of predation in it. Um, and um, I, so I sort of fear for that in a way. Um, let, let, me, um, let me go back to the question of silence, if I may ask you something. You, you, you gave us a lovely anthology, very, very succinct and to the point of how the Lazarus story has been realised by uh, so many poets and so many writers. You didn't mention Berryman and Lazarus digging himself back into the ground again as soon as he possibly could, that particular vision, or the vision, the Beckett vision, which, which would say that it is better to be dead than alive, yes. best of all never to have been born. So I was going to ask you about Beckett, because you, it seemed to me you begin with the they, who are very like the people who come and give you something to eat and interrogate you. In, for instance, as the story was told, that, you know, that 50, a, 50, a single paragraph story by Beckett, as the story was told. Um, would, you, would you say, you've written very beautifully and touchingly about Beckett. Do you feel this at all within this work or not? Um, I, I suppose I do to some extent um, in that, um, 
th that idea that um, uh, there's a wonderful moment in the 30s when Beckett is in London and, and he goes to a lecture by Young, you know, J-U-N-G, and he, he hears Young talking about a patient who had never been born, who'd literally not been born, who'd come biologically into the world but not spiritually. And Beckett was utterly fascinated by that idea. And of course, it's dynamite if you're a novelist because you can actually start make if you can start making characters who have only come partly into the world spiritually, whose other parts are not, it's not just merely they're in the womb, they're sort of nowhere, they're wandering. That if you can yeah. get that into cadences or even into, e even just into the body of the work. Um, and so, so I'm interested in how Beckett worked with that. Um, and uh, especially in a work like Company, mm -hmm. you know, where he is using memory, he is going back or he, he includes his own births, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know his father going for a walk, hoping he'll be born by the time he comes home. At the same time, the man is lying in the dark with all that all those repetitions, the dark, imagined company. Um, no, how do you know? How do we know? Uh, so I suppose I I I I learned a lot from that, and um, and for, yes yes from those texts and from that general philosophy, but uh, but I. Um, and also, there are very good things about the, aren't there in Beckett, generally about Jesus? I mean, um, and the, the two thieves. And I mean, he, he generally has a field day at the whole business of um, the Bible. Um, and uh, uh, I, I mean, a lot of it's very funny. The problem is, I, I find it difficult to be funny. Yeah. You were very, oh. Um, I didn't think that there were two of you. I didn't think that the person who was so funny um, uh, at first <laughs> had turned into become a completely different person. But it is true that the, <clears throat> the Testament of Mary should not be read uh, for laugh. Um, that is, and even the Beckett kind of, I mean, you know, Beckett, uh, Beckett quoting that which nobody's ever been able to find, uh, do not despair, one of the thieves was saved. Mm. Do not presume, one of the thieves was damned. Now that, that uh, the shape, you remember Beckett, he loved mm. the shape of mm. that. And uh, I, the thieves are very important in your story, including what you do not, the kind of attention you don't give them. No. That is, it is supposed that crucifixion of our Lord was different in kind, as indeed it had to be if you believe, the, if you believe the, the Testament, different in kind from the crucifixion of anybody else. Uh, so it's not, that I'm, it's not that I'm making an equal opportunity or affirmative action point about the thieves, but they are subdued, very, they're very duly subdued by your story, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, they're almost not there. No, no, well, almost not there, that's very good. Um, that is, there are some sort of potent absence. One is reminded of sufferings that are not the sufferings of our Lord. Yeah. And it, to not have them there at all would, I think, be very wrong. To have them be central to the imagination of your narrator would, would also have to yeah. be wrong, wouldn't yeah. it? But let, let me please open it for questions. I've had a chance to say a few expressions of gratitude to you. Please. Thank you. Uh, James Joyce once said, um, I believe the quote is, I don't see what good it is to fulminate against the English tyranny uh, while the Roman tyranny occupies the palace of the soul. And uh, obviously, <laughs> for many decades after that, Ireland continued to be a predominantly Catholic country. Um, up until recently when there was sort of a precipitous drop in religiosity in Ireland. Um, so I'm wondering, apart from your own uh, possible loss of faith, um, I'm wondering how observing the, the sort of waning faith of others has maybe influenced your writing. Um, I suppose that, uh, you, know, you know, I was born in 1955, and both of my parents were brought up under Irish independence in the Republic of Ireland so that um, I didn't really ever have English tyranny. And, and I, would very, I would be very uneasy about the idea of it um, as affecting me, for example. I think you could make a really great case. I could make everyone weep here that, this, that the very language I'm speaking is not my language. I could do that Stephen Dedalus business about, you know, Tondish, and I could say the, the way Christ, when he says Christ, master, ale, they're his words and not mine. But, 
that that's simply not true. <laughs> it's simply just not true because language is such a basic thing. The first language you speak is your language. To talk about maybe there's some other language which really is yours, I think is fraudulent and just uh, um, wrong. Uh, um, so that the tyranny I was brought up under, uh, oddly enough, was Irish tyranny. And um, I didn't feel Roman tyranny one way or the other, or I didn't feel English tyranny. I never forget going to London for the first time. The sheer liberty of it. Not just the size of the place, but the fact that I could see Last Tango in Paris, which, <laughs> oddly enough at the time, mattered to me enormously for various reasons. Um, and um, I couldn't see Last Tango in Paris. It, it was in a small cinema of Leicester Square. And I'll never forget it. Whereas um, in, in the Irish had banned it, and this was 1974. And um, <laughs> um, England, for me, represented always liberty, ease, English publishing. Every aspect of England um, came to me easily. If I'd obviously been a Catholic in Northern Ireland, that would have been a different matter. However, I would have had British soldiers bat battering down my door. I didn't. And there's no point in saying I did. Um, and the other matter is even more, is even more, I mean, it's the Roman one. Well, you know, um, twice a week, sometimes three times, we went to Pugin's Cathedral um, in Enniscorthy, built during the famine because the, uh, the Catholic middle classes had so much money they were making out of, you know, grubbing out of, you know, putting up the price of everything. While half Ireland was starving, the other half of Catholic Ireland was getting richer. And they built this, they brought in Pugin in the very years and built this magnificent cathedral with exquisite stained glass, with arches, neo-Gothic color. And so my connection to beauty, which is not nothing, comes from that building and what I heard in that building. And from the choir, the Enniscorthy choir, people I knew and saw on the street singing Mozart's Ave Verum and not even knowing what it was and from the words, um, which, um, I mean, I was an altar boy, and um, the vestments, the colors of the vestments, the, the, the level of the ceremony, and when it moved into English, and so, Father, we bring you these gifts, we ask you to make them holy by the power of your spirit. And that being said, and everyone bowing their heads to the words, and the very words themselves changing uh, the bread, into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that came to me and entered my spirit fundamentally. It didn't oppress me. Now, obviously, there were, they made these silly rules about sex. And it was funny thing was how quickly we all got over that. I and mean, we never believed that stuff. You know? And I suppose that there was a shame attached to homosexuality. But it wasn't caused by the church. It was caused by the people. It was caused by everyone around. It was caused by the guys in school with you. It was caused by your friends. Maybe, maybe the church was involved in that, but they weren't daily at it. They weren't daily calling someone a queer and you realize, no, I'm the queer. They were your friends. They, they were your neighbors. So it was, uh, and there was a general sense of oppression from the political party that ran the country, which my father was involved in, Fianna Fáil, um, and indeed from Fine Gael, which is worse than it. <laughs> and I've never voted in my life for a party in Ireland that won, uh, that, you know, I've, I've Voted for the Labour Party, but I've never voted for a party that won an election. I voted for Mary. Ro I voted for Mary Robinson when she was made president. But I've all, you know, that in other words, it's very easy to be marginalised in Ireland, and and you're not being marginalised by um, Rome or by England. You're marginal. It's our it's our business. The country is our business. We we can we can change it. And I suppose I believe this passionately, that it's our country, and to blame anyone for our country other than ourselves is a mistake. And I, but I can see Joyce's position, because he really was um, interested in the idea of the way in which the Catholic Church had colluded almost, especially with, after the foundation of Maynooth College in the late um, 18th century, with the Church and the English joining forces in somehow oppressing the full people. But I didn't live like that. I, I wasn't brought up in that country. Thank you. I have a question. Thank you. 
Oh, I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you imagined yourself using the Bible. I noticed you quoted it a couple of times. Did you did you feel a set level of responsibility toward it, or I, I suppose that's a broad question? <laughs> but um, I grew to love John, and not to feel the same about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, and um, that. Um, and then I went down to Ephesus, um, which is in Turkey now, and was in Greece, and realized that John had been there. And I had a vision, I didn't put it into the book, of John being in one of those great theaters and seeing Medea or Electra or, or Antigone and actually understanding the power of a grieving woman's voice um, from what he saw in the Greek theater and putting that in to the Testament in a way the others didn't. Um, but uh, um, he also did a thing that, uh, you know, he, he has Jesus speaking from the cross, saying, this is thy mother, this is thy son, which I, I really, you know, you know, I didn't feel obliged to follow. And uh, I suppose what, 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 what I'm working with are, are two ideas of story, one in which maybe a novelist will put a shape on things, and the other one in which actually the day-to-day -day business of what the world is like, the messy quotidian strangeness of the world, which art manages somehow or other, sometimes not to, or a lot, most of the time, not to capture. Because art is involved with pattern and shape and trying to find meaning or connections or, or, or resonance. But, but that those two things going against each other, the men trying to find the story and her saying, no, there was no story. There were just things that happened and they did not connect because I remember them because I was there. And, and just hitting those two things against each other as though there were two colors or even two instruments and seeing what would happen with that. But, but so that I was going against the Testament as written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even John in, in, in the way I was trying to think. Uh, I was trying to think against pattern, against meaning, and against um, completion, or in any way, you know, creating a circle or, or, or a fixed space for experience. Oh, sorry. Please. Uh, sorry, I think, I think you need a mic. Do you have a mic? If you can hear me. No, I know, but seemingly they need a... The mic's have got... Oh, oh. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe jumping from the uh, thoughts of biblical influence, were, did you have any um, thinking about uh, other fictionalized versions of the Jesus and Mary story, like Last Temptation of Christ and even Master Margarita parts? Um, no, I didn't. It, it was the poems that mattered more than the fiction. And it was only after I had written it that I read Saramago's book, which is, which is a really great book, and it's better than mine. Um, it's called The Gospel According to Jesus Christ, and there's a crucifixion of Joseph in that. That is a magnificent piece of work. And he also went quite far with the Mary Magdalene and Jesus story, which I thought was just too easy to do, to bring, you know, sexualizing the story, which I didn't want to do. Um, but um, I, no, no, I read his book afterwards, but what I really, really looked at was Tintoretto's Crucifixion, which is in Venice, which is the, what the painting that Henry James most was interested in in Venice because of its untidiness and the way in which it went against the whole idea of creating um, fixed beauty, that it was untidy, chaotic beauty. It, it was giving a picture that must have really shocked people when they saw it. So it was, it was the Tintoretto that I went back to look at again and again, and I suppose also, to some extent, Bach, Bach St. John's Passion, um, the sort of emotion in that of aria versus recitative, how the two went against each other, which I was trying to mirror in some way in how she would speak, that sometimes she would say something about the world, and then she would go back to story in the same way as that does. But so I found music and painting more interesting. But then I read Saramago's book, and I was you know, w wondering, well, I, I admire Saramago's, bo Saramago's book enormously. Thank you. Please. I have a question. You brought up Henry James. Um, <laughs> I compare the master to this book. And and I and if you know doing doing a kind of fictionalization of a of a life, 
and they're obviously very different. I mean, the differences are outweigh the similarities. And one difference is that you've writ you wrote the master in the third person, and the Testament of Mary is in the first person. And and I wondered if that, how that decision would have maybe related to the different way you felt James's kind of as a historical figure or feeling Mary as a kind of cultural icon or visual or, or product of visual culture, in some way of her a more abstract. Um, presence in the culture led to a first person narrative or um, compared to James, or if there were other reasons for that? Um, uh, these, these were really technical problems. Yeah. Um, in other words, um, to do Henry James in the first person had to allow in a voice uh, which would essentially be comic, because James, when he spoke, was very, very funny. Everyone who knew him did imitations of his extraordinary grandiloquence. And his grandiloquence was often laced with humor. And he was a hypochondriac. And he was ridiculous in many ways. So that you would have to sort of deal with this man's suffering. And well, uh, suffering is a strong word there. But I mean this man's inner life in a tone which would essentially be ridiculous. And I did not have the technical qualifications to do that. It, it should be possible, by the way. I think it's something John Banville, for example, does very well, managing a sort of an ironic glaze which he puts over things that I felt I couldn't do with James. I wanted to make James much more somber than if he became first person. With Mary, what I became interested in was that voice which um, I um, came across. Um, I gave a course. I mean, I shouldn't have given this course. And, and the people who attended it, I'm sure, have never recovered in the, <laughs> in the new school in 2000 called Relentlessness. And you can imagine the sort of students who came to it. <laughs> and we really had a marvelous time, you know. And uh, we looked at Medea, Electra. We looked at uh, Antigone. We looked at some Bergman movies. We, we read some, you know, James Baldwin and Nadine Gordon Coetze. You know, we, we, we really went for, like, not a word. This business of the strung out voice, the, the, the voice that is, has taken so much coffee or done so much suffering. And of course, um, you know, I, I can recite from memory. I, I, I get one stanza slightly wrong, but I can do Sylvia Plath's Daddy. And I can do a good Lady Lazarus uh, at late at night, you know. Or, oh, die, you know, um, darling, all night I have been, or, or well, the other one, <laughs> Fever, Fever 103, you know. Or, oh, darling, all night I have been flickering off on, off on. The sheets grow heavy as a lecher's kiss. Three days, three nights, lemon water, chicken water, water, make me wretch. You know, I, 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 and, um, and when I was in Stanford, um, Ivan Boland told me, uh, one day, quite innocently, you know, did not knowing the harm I was going to do, that I was to go and read Louise Glick. We were colleagues, you know, she just recommended a poet to me. So I just, you know, went home and on, on Amazon ordered some Louise Glick who I hadn't been paying attention to. And the way in which Louise Glick was, was using contemporary personal experience and a sort of voice that was strung out, um, using uh, mythology, began to really interest me. And then, um, uh, you know, I, 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 the, the other one that really interested me was Coetzee's um, the, the Master of Petersburg, where I found in that book, especially in the opening 80 pages or so of it, where Coetzee, who was meant to be writing about Dostoevsky, clearly wasn't, clearly whatever he was exploring in that book. I mean, it's not a book that is, it's not one of his widely read books. And because I, I think it, it falls off as it goes on, but the first 80 pages where he goes to identify his son in a morgue could not have come from, uh, well, let it put the other way around, must have come from something. And so that I real, once, I, once I felt that, reading that book, I realized what I would do with these two books was create a sort of secret self or offer these come from places very deep for me. It, I'm not making this up, or I'm not just going to look for a new subject. Both of these subjects, I found metaphors or ways I could work things out for myself. And uh, um, I didn't even know that sometimes when I was working. It was only when I was finished sometimes I realized, oh, I know what I've been using. And so both of those books are just ways of, uh, of, of um, I suppose, finding fiction uh, as a way to explore experience 
without having to write about the dull business of being me. One more question only because of the hour. I'm please. going on too long, am I? No, no, <clears throat> that was not what I meant or intimated. Thank you. But I do need reassurance please. all the same. No. Because, <laughs> please. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your work. I really, I love all of your work, so thank you for it. Um, I'm wondering, I was so interested in what you said at the beginning about how you realized that you were sort of kicking Ireland when it down. Um, I was thinking about the, the kind of waves of disbelief that have seemed to have come across Ireland in the last, say, 20, 25, 30 years. And I was thinking primarily of in the 80s and 90s when there were all these sort of um, rewritings of Mary, you know? And, and the, I don't know if you remember all the, the stories in the newspaper about the weeping virgins. And then there was um, popular culture, Margot Harkin's uh, story about uh, the, the pregnant girl imagining the Virgin Mary, and I just, it's not really a question, I'm just curious if you, if you, how you see this, this book of yours in the context of that, or if you see it as sort of within a continuum of, of the connection between disbelief and, and the, the real, uh, the feelings, the, the many feelings of women and men in Ireland about Mary. Yeah, um, you know, I had to be careful not to think about that, that I could talk about it now, because I wrote it a few years ago, as being an effort to intervene in some way or other, using the imagination into a place that, where intervention seemed almost necessary. But I certainly didn't think that when I was working. In other words, I was working blindly a lot of the time without a clue where I was going. But that um, we have to recognize that the figure of Mary, for example, the apparitions, um, the, the apparition in Medjugorje, and, and I went there, you know, occurred at an absolute crisis in the, in the life of Bosnia-Herzegovina and in Croatian Catholicism. And so too, the, the apparition in Nock, in, in the west of Ireland in 1879, at, at, a, at a time when one culture was giving way to the other, and indeed in Lourdes, and, and indeed in Fatima, and indeed in Guadalupe. And that, the, 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 because of Mary's silence, therefore people can pray to her in, in, in a way which, which is much more fulfilling and because of, 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 her, of her suffering and, and, and the sense of what she went through silently. So that that business um, is, is, it becomes really important when you realize that Ephesus, where St. John was and where St. Paul was, um, is filled with statues of Artemis, temples of Diana. It's a landscape of the goddess. And that Mary was declared the mother of Jesus in Ephesus, not in Rome, in 431. That she was declared no longer to be the mortal mother of the mortal Jesus, but to be the mother of God in Ephesus. And that that idea that somehow or other in our, I mean, I hesitate to use the term in the grounds of our beseeching, but you know what I mean, in, 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 in the, you know, if Elias were here, uh, he would just, he would, he would take over because that, that idea of somehow in the grounds of our beseeching this figure, which Robert Lowell w w would also have felt in, in, in those wonderful poems, that somehow helpless mother, mother, calling her mother, and also her silence, and also her sympathy and pity, and that this isn't nothing, you know, in other words, you don't have to read histories of, I mean, I mean, Marina Warner's book, Alone of All Her Sex, is probably the best book on this subject because she takes up the idea of the mythology. But I suppose what I would argue, and Marina would argue too, that this has been necessary in so many societies, but not merely in societies, in so many personal consciences, in so many ways of being in the world. Having faith or belief in Mary has mattered in certain countries in poor countries in Europe. In other words, it's interesting that it was the flat, richer countries that were able to turn easier away from that. But in places like Ireland or Slovakia or Spain or Croatia or um, Lithuania, it wasn't as easy that somehow it, that it was needed. So that she emerges as a powerful figure in times of crisis or need. And I, I was very acutely conscious of that when I was working that I wasn't in the blaspheming industry. 
You know, I, I, was, I was in a strange space that I wasn't sure about. But, but I'm still glad that the priest I mentioned couldn't hear the thing because it, <laughs> I didn't want to offend anyone, really. Well, I'm, I'm sure I speak for everybody and I say how glad we are to have heard you. The magnanimity of your work is continuous with the magnanimity that you've shown tonight. So please join me in thanking Colin Tyson. <laughs>